Hello, welcome back. This is Amrita again, taking you through some lessons in mass communication. Researchers and communication scholars also talk about intrapersonal communication or small group communication, organizational communication or public communication. Let us study these types briefly. Intrapersonal communication is a one-way communication, individual contemplation, internal reflection, prayers are types of intrapersonal communication. This type can also be termed as a form of internal persuasion. There are two types of messages, non-verbal and verbal. Examples of non-verbal communication are facial expressions, posture, gestures, tone of voice, touching, spacing and systematic use of time. Small group communication is an interactional process that occurs among three or more people, interacting in an attempt to achieve commonly recognized goals, either face to face or through mediated forms. The larger the group, the less intimate and personal is the possibility of exchange. Feedback is the key word here. Feedback is not instantaneous and is difficult to measure. Organizational communication involves the interaction of individuals in a formal working environment. When an executive sends a message down a chain of command, this is a form of organizational communication. Public communication involves one person who speaks to a large number of people. For example, a teacher speaking to his students or a politician speaking to a crowd at a rally. These forms of communication can take place interpersonally or they can be mediated. A group planning a river rafting vacation can meet face to face or can interact through email. The boss could talk to her junior face to face or leave a message in their phone box. A professor could lecture the class in person or leave a video recording for students to watch. While the means and the types of communication so far described have their differences, they have one central similarity and that is they all have a message to convey. Seven major elements are involved in every interaction in which there is a message. These elements are the source, the encoder, the transmitter, the channel, the decoder, the receiver and the feedback. Let's take them one at a time. The source is the originator of the message. The source may be a person like you or me who initiates the message. Or it could be a group of people, like when a choir is singing. The source could also be an organization, like your bank. If you receive a letter from them in your mailbox, then they are the source. The source may or may not have knowledge about the intended receiver of the message. But it does have a message or idea to transmit to someone else or some other organization. Encoding is the process by which the source translates the thoughts and ideas so that they can be perceived by the human senses. When you communicate, you have a particular purpose in mind. You want to show that you are a friendly person, you want to give them some information, 
you want to get them to do something, you want to persuade them of your point of view. So you as the source have to express your purpose in the form of a message. That message has to be formulated in some kind of a code. How do the source's purposes get translated into a code? This requires an encoder. The communication encoder is responsible for taking the ideas of the source and putting them in a code, expressing the source's purpose in the form of a message. In person-to-person -person communication, the encoding process is performed by the motor skills of the source, vocal mechanisms, lip and tongue movements, the vocal cords, the lungs, the face muscles, the muscles in the hands and so on. It's fairly easy to think in terms of the source and the encoder when you are talking on the phone, which is then known as the transmitter. You are the source of the message and the phone is the encoder, which does the job of turning your sounds into electrical impulses. The distinction is not quite so obvious when you think of yourself communicating face to face. But in a way, the vocal cords could be considered a transmitter when the communication is face to face. The telephone is a good example of mediating technology or medium of communication. A medium is a part of a technical system that helps in the transmission, distribution or reception of messages. It helps communication take place when the senders and the receivers are not face to face. Uh, can you speak English? Yes. How can I help you? Uh, hi, this is Rob Winslow of IBM calling. Is Hiroshi Tanimoto there? Uh, I'm sorry, could I have your name again? The internet is an example of medium used. Just like all the others. The television, the radio, the DVD and the CD. All communication whether mediated or not, takes place through channels. Channels are the pathways through which the transmitter sends all features of the message, whether they involve sight, sound, smell or touch. When a man on the street shouts at you or speaks to you, the channel is the air through which the sound waves move from the man's vocal cords. If your friend speaks to you, through the phone, two channels are at work here. One channel is the air that vibrates the phone mechanism and the other is the wire through which the electrical impulses move towards you. Just as a source needs an encoder to translate her purposes into a message, so the receiver needs a decoder to retranslate. The transmitted impulses must be converted to signs that the brain can perceive as meaningful. In the case of the interpersonal communication, the decoder is biological. The brain is the decoder here, when the telephone is the medium. The receiver is the person or organization that finally gets the designed message. Feedback occurs when the receiver responds to the message with what the sender perceives as a message. As this diagram shows, two people continue the communication by continuously receiving and responding to each other's messages. The same thing happens with mediated interpersonal communication. The communication episode ends only when one of them stops sending the feedback to the other. One person walks away or the parties hang up on the telephone. Feedback does not always take place immediately, especially in a mediated interpersonal communication. For example, an email may not get an immediate response. Noise is an environmental, mechanical 
and semantic sound in the communication system that interferes with the delivery of the message. Environmental sound comes from the setting where the source and the receiver are communicating. In an interpersonal communication situation, Ravi, the source, might be at a movie theatre with sound in the background. And Saloni, the receiver, might be at a cricket match with loud commentary in the background. Mechanical noises comes from the medium through which the communication is taking place. Suppose there is static on the phone. That would create a lot of disturbance and add to the environmental noise. Semantic noise involves language that one or more of the participants do not understand. Let us imagine Ravi telling Saloni that the bowler attempted a bouncer that turned into a beamer. Even when Ravi repeats the words three times through the environmental and mechanical noise so that she hears them, Saloni is clueless about what Ravi is talking about since she knows very little about the game of cricket. Now let's move from communication to mass communication. One way to understand mass communication is to show its similarities to and differences from other forms of communication. One similarity is that mass communication takes place through the media. Small groups can come together in virtual chat rooms that are connected through wired networks. Organizations can connect their employees through video conference facilities that are linked through cables and satellites. And professors who deliver public lectures can record them for projection from a computer server to different classes at different times. In other words, the channels used in mediated forms of interpersonal, group, public and organizational communications are sometimes similar to those used in mass communication. Yet another similarity between these other forms of communication and mass communication is that we can describe mass communication using the same terms of source, encoder, transmitter, channel, decoder, receiver, feedback and noise that we use in communication. But here is also where we begin to see the difference. The most vital differences are in the source of the message, its transmitter and the way the feedback takes place. In the other forms of communication, we have discussed individuals are the source of the message. In mass communication, by contrast, complex organizations Often companies take responsibility for the activity. The source here is an organization and not an individual. You could argue that when you are watching a channel like NDTV 24-7 and the news is being read by Pranoy Roy, the source of the news for you is from the news reader. And so Pranoy Roy is the source. Apparently it looks like a case of simple mediated interpersonal communication. But is it really that simple? Behind the news, there are a host of people who work all through the day preparing the news. The news reader is reading the news and hence he is seen as the source. But employees of NDTV helped him write the script, produced and edited the videos that went with the news story. The pictures and clips may have been brought from another agency, such as ANI or Reuters. The critical role of organizations in mass communication compared to other communication forms also show up in the transmission of the message. In interpersonal, small group and public communication, an individual sender or a committee takes responsibility for sending or transmitting the message. Perhaps using a microphone when speaking to a crowd or using the telephone when speaking to someone far away. In mass communication, however, the transmission is too complex to be accomplished by one person or even a small group of people. 
that is because transmission involves distributing the material to several locations and presenting the material to those locations. Instead of a few individuals, a number of organizations are typically involved in the process. When the news reader reads the news, his vocal cords transmit the words into a microphone. The air and electric current are a channel for them. That may seem no different from a mediated interpersonal communication, but that is just the beginning. Transmission of the news requires a number of steps. First, the show is sent to a satellite company. From there, its network sends it to cable TV systems around the country. The cable systems receive those messages and then send them to head-end transmission centers that they own. These centers send out the program through coaxial cables that eventually connect to television sets in locations like homes, bars and hotels where subscribers have paid to receive the signal. In this way, millions of people across the country can watch the same news at the same time. Of course, individuals do work for production and distribution firms involved in mass communication. But the creation and the transmission of mass media messages, of news articles, television programs, recorded music, etc. are the result of decisions and activities of many people working together in companies that interact with other companies. The third major difference between mass communication and other forms of communication relate to feedback. One of them is whether it is immediate or whether delayed. The second is whether or not it goes directly to the initial message creator or to someone else who may or may not pass it on to the creator. In other forms of communication, feedback from the people receiving the message goes directly to the individual who created the message, either immediately, as in the clapping of an audience, listening to the speaker or in a delayed form as in a reply to an email your brother may have written to you. In mass communication, a feedback from all the receivers is almost impossible because of the number of receivers involved. Think of the millions of people watching news. Even when feedback does happen, the people who created the original message may not always get the whole lot of responses. Someone else who is appointed to deal with the feedback will generally receive your message. An indirect approach to audience feedback marks a common difference between mass communication and other forms of communication. In unmediated personal communication, group communication, organizational communication and public communication, feedback is often both immediate and direct. However, in mass media organizations, feedback is not only often delayed, but it is indirect as well. It is generally rooted through layers of the company that deal specifically with audience concerns, weighed for its relevance and only then summarized for the people who sparked the feedback in the first place. If you ever wanted to respond to a news capsule, would you get to speak to the anchor directly? The answer is that most likely there is no chance you would be able to do that. But if you write him a letter or an email, chances are that the producers or the staff members whose job it is to summarize complaints and feedback will intercept it. This is typical of mass media organizations. Typically, the news section gets thousands of letters and emails and its principles are too busy to attend to all audience letters and phone calls. The idea of noise again can be similar and different in mass communication when compared to other forms of communication. 
if there was a cricket match going on and if the microphones of the commentators did not work, they would not be heard. Similarly, if you were at a party where there was loud music, nothing of what you said would be heard even by those standing next to you, as there would be too much of noise. Again, mechanical noise in a mass communication situation can take place in the sending and receiving technologies. Breakdowns in cable and satellite receivers, for example, can create mechanical noise problems for large audiences. To complete the comparison, the announcer's use of cricket terms might befuddle some people in the audience as their knowledge of cricket was limited. Now we will study this chart to summarize the differences in types of communication that we have just explored. Interpersonal communication, mediated interpersonal communication, mass communication. Now let us see how the message differs in each of these. In interpersonal communication, the message uses all the senses. In mediated interpersonal communication, the message is typically verbal or visual. In mass communication, the message is typically verbal and or visual again. In interpersonal communication, the source is normally an individual. In mediated interpersonal communication, again, the source is normally an individual. And in mass communication, the source could be one or more organizations. In interpersonal communication, the encoding is done by an individual's brain. In mediated interpersonal communication, the encoding is done by an individual's brain and technology. In mass communication, it is normally done by an organization and technology. In interpersonal communication, the channel is the air. In mediated interpersonal communication, the channel is the air or it could be the technology. And in mass communication, similarly, the channel is either the air or the technology. In interpersonal communication, the receiver is a few individuals in the same location. While in mediated interpersonal communication, the receiver is a few or many individuals in the same location. In mass communication, the receiver typically is many different people in different locations. In interpersonal communication, the decoding is normally done by an individual's brain. In mediated interpersonal communication, the decoding is done by technology and by an individual's brain. In mass communication, similarly, the decoding is done by technology and by an individual's brain. In interpersonal communication, the feedback is immediate and direct. In mediated interpersonal communication, the feedback is immediate or delayed, but generally direct. While in mass communication, the feedback is immediate or delayed and generally indirect. In interpersonal communication, the noise affecting the message is environmental, mechanic and semantic. In mediated interpersonal communication, the noise affecting is environmental, mechanic and semantic with environmental sometimes caused by organizations. While in mass communication, the noise in the message is due to environmental, mechanic and semantic sometimes caused by organizations. That brings us to the end of this lesson and you will now be able to discuss the differences among interpersonal communication, mediated communication and mass communication. You can explain why an unorthodox definition of mass communication makes the term especially relevant in today's media environment. You can trace the pattern of the growth and development of communication from the early times to the present era. I hope you have gained knowledge and liked today's lesson. I'll see you again. Goodbye.